Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Noah Mintz. I'm Community Bookstore's events director. Welcome. Community Bookstore is celebrating over 50 years in business, and we credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone. So thank you all for spending the evening with us. Uh, one of the rare joys of this pandemic era has been the opportunity to work with other booksellers, to connect with readers and writers and translators across the country and around the world. Tonight, we're collaborating once again with our friends at Third Place Books in Seattle and the Transnational Literature Series at Brookline Booksmith in Boston. Over the course of the past year, we three bookstores have worked together to bring you virtual events with Olga Tokarczyk and Jennifer Croft, Alejandro Zambra and Megan McDowell, Brenda Lozano and Heather Cleary, Halder Locksmith's translator, Philip Rotten, Katie Whittemore and her triptych of new novels uh, from Open Letter Books. And next month, we'll have one more event with Emma Ramadan and Olivia Baez celebrating their new translation of Marguerite de Ross. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations, by the way. I will also drop a link in the chat. I'm so grateful to have colleagues and co-conspirators like Spencer and Pierce at those two stores. And tonight, we are very thrilled to welcome the great translator, Maureen Freely, for the release of her translation of Sevgi Soysal's novel, Dawn, in conversation with author, scholar, and critic, Merve Emre. Soysal uh, was born in Turkey in 1936 and lived a short but extremely prolific and impactful life. She was a revolutionary intellectual who wrote a brilliant set of endearing and illuminating story collections, novels, and memoirs. In her memoir, Black Milk, uh, the writer Elif Shafak writes, in the antagonistic environment of the 70s, when the country was divided between leftists and rightists, Soysal questioned in clever flowing prose, patriarchal precedents on all sides. She was the writer of women dangling on the threshold between sanity and insanity, society and the individual, setting the table and walking away, endless self-sacrifice and impromptu selfishness. She created female characters who straddle the divide between living for others and following their hearts. Dawn was first published in Turkish in 1975. Its concerns, one of, of one's responsibility to others and to oneself, fluctuations and sticking points of class identification, the coercions women face in patriarchal societies and so many other lines of inquiry and argument remain critical for working people around the world. It is available now in English for the first time. Thank you to the efforts of Maureen Freely and the good folks at Archipelago Books, a publisher that is all but synonymous with literature in translation here in the United States. Um, so now to some housekeeping briefly before I properly introduce our guests. We've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, you can click on the live transcription button on the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please do click on the Q&A button, which is also on the bottom of your screen. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's also a chat box to which I'll be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for tonight is that we're all at the mercy of our own home internet connections. So please bear with any technical issues that could arise. and We will resolve them as quickly as we can. Uh, we have a really stellar lineup of in-person and virtual events for you through the end of the year and into next year, although we are winding down. So head over to communitybookstore.net and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. And now a little about tonight's guests and we'll get started. Maureen Freely is a writer, translator, senior lecturer at Warwick University and the president of English Pen. Her seventh novel, Sailing Through Byzantium, was chosen as one of the best novels of 2014 by the Sunday Times. She has translated or co-translated a number of Turkish memoirs and classics, including the Time Regulation Institute by Ahmed Hamdi Tanpanar and five works by the Turkish novelist and Nobel laureate Orhan Pamuk. She also co-translated A Useless Man by Seyd Feik Abisayanik, excuse my Turkish, with Alex Dawes. Um, You'll have to correct me when you get uh, back on when you get on screen, you too. Um, she's widely regarded as the foremost translator of Turkish literature. Sevgi Soysal was the first writer she ever translated. And Merve Emre is Associate Professor of English at the University of Oxford. She is the author of Paraliterary, The Making of Bad Readers in Post-War America, The Ferrante Letters, and The Personality Brokers. She's finishing a book titled Post-Discipline, Literature, Professionalism, and the Crisis of the Humanities, and writing a book called Love and Other Useless Pursuits. She's a contributing writer at The New Yorker. Her essays and criticism have appeared in The New York Review of Books, Harper's, New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, and The London Review of Books. From 2022 to 23, she is a distinguished writer in residence at the Shapiro Center at Wesleyan University. Now, without any further ado, I will leave it to you to Maureen Merve. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for having us. Maureen, congratulations on this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful translation. And as I already told you over email, and as I'm going to tell you and everyone again, I was reading it at my parents' house 
which is where I am now. And if my mom bursts in through the door with excitement, you'll have to excuse her and me. Uh, but I was reading it at my parents' house and uh, my mother, who was in her teens when the events narrated in this novel take place, I uh, saw me reading it and immediately started sort of gushing about how Seb Gisoisal was the hero, the literary hero of her adolescence, uh, how she was an inspiration to leftist feminist students who were trying to find a space for protest, a space for freedom. And my mother was surprised to see me reading this because she thought Save Gisoisal had been forgotten and was surprised to see her in translation. And I thought that for the members of the audience who can't place her or don't have mothers who can place her on their behalf, we could just start with you giving a little bit of context about how to locate Seyf Gisoysal in Turkish literature and in Turkish politics, particularly in those tumultuous years of the 60s and the 70s? Well, we could even uh, start in the 1950s because Seyf Gisoysal was a second wave feminist because before there was second wave feminism, long before. Uh, it wasn't unusual for women um, uh, uh, and married women and, um, and mothers to um, have uh, you know, to lead professional lives as well as their, their home lives. And so she was working for uh, the radio, for the German Cultural Center. Um, she was translating from a very, very early stage in her career and um, acting in plays that she translated and um, was kind of changed uh, women's programming in uh, um, Turkish radio and television um, at a very, very early stage. And but in all of this time, and especially when she started writing novels, she just was never the kind of person that the guys wanted her to be. Um, her first novel uh, was, uh, uh, she was prosecuted for obscenity. And the, uh, the, the, the second novel, uh, which was about her German mothers, the women in her German mother's family, was um, dismissed as uh, reading like a translation. And, uh, and so, although she was very much involved in revolutionary politics, or say social justice politics, and the, the, the great inequities of, uh, of the country, she, she was never a follower. She was always... which come from the time of the, um, the, the, uh, the coup of 1971 and, and its aftermath. She, um, uh, really ex she, she really, more than anybody else for me, um, expressed the, um, the inner life of that uh, revolutionary age and on the problems of being in a military, uh, living under um, a military dictatorship. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I thought that she was going to be, um, or she had been forgotten as well, but um, but she's you know she's inspiring um, contemporary Turkish women um, and uh, writers and readers now just as much as before, mm -hmm. and I think possibly because things haven't changed as much as we'd like, and not just in Turkey. Right. Yeah, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about how given enough time in between her original publication and your translations of her, things seem to have regressed in yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, which makes her more timely now than perhaps in the 90s, for instance, or the early aughts. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, that's true. But also uh, there is continuity uh, because um, there's a, a much neglected but really, really strong um, uh, feminist um, uh, strand in, in Turkish life. And um, uh, even and especially now when there's not supposed to be anybody um, thinking like these thoughts, but but they are. And and uh, they're writing um, uh, very, very boldly and um, doing really interesting things in, in uh, television and theater as well. Just when you think that um, the great Erdogan had stamped them all down. Well, and you and you translated her before you translated Orhan. And oh, yeah. 
Before you translated anything else. I mean, she was the first writer that you ever translated. Isn't that, is that okay. correct? Sure. Yes. Was it her uh, prison memoir, her prison memoir that you translated first? Yeah, it, uh, Yildirim Bölge Kadınlar Koluşu. She was uh, Yildirim District uh, Women's uh, Barracks. And uh, it's um, a collection of the, the pieces that she wrote for a newspaper uh, about her time in a political prison, about a year she spent. And um, the reason I happened onto it is I was working as um, a very badly qualified secretary at uh, Amnesty International after I graduated from college and went, came to England. And um, uh, at that time, she had just, um, uh, her husband, Mumtaz Soysal, who is an, uh, um, a professor of constitutional law, was um, in the International Secretariat of Amnesty International, so he was always coming through. And Sevgi had just died, you know, age 40, um, two really tiny children, I mean, really tiny children. And he gave me two books. He gave me uh, uh, Don um, Shafak, and he gave me Yildim uh, Bölge, and he asked me to translate them. So I started with um, with Yildim um, Bölge, uh, I can't tell you what uh, an effect that book ha has had on me. It's it changed my view of the country I grew up in. I mean, I I, grew, I lived in Turkey from the age of eight. My parents spent most of their lives there, and they're buried there. So, so it absolutely changed. It was a story that was going on um, uh, under my nose, and that I didn't uh, uh, realize. So, um, uh, but at the time, I was the only one <laughs> who. Um, was being affected by this book. I couldn't find anybody to uh, to publish it. It's still not been published, my translation, but it's there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, one thing that happens when you translate um, is that you live, in, especially if you're a novelist to start with, uh, you, you live inside that space that the author has created for you. So I... I felt that I had been as a ghost, if, if nothing else, in that um, in that women's barracks of mm -hmm. watching um, how these women, uh, yes, they suffered, but the most amazing thing about this book was how they kept their spirits up. Mm -hmm. uh, all these, yeah, and and um, she's tremendously um, uh, vivacious and witty uh, woman, um, and uh, you can see that in all the stories she told um, about that time. Yeah. And, and in many ways, Dawn is a continuation of that space. Yeah. Because yeah. It's, yeah. It's yeah. the story of what happens to a woman after she's released from yeah. a political prison and sent into exile in yeah. China, which yeah. we were talking about earlier is where I was born. Yeah. And, yeah. and it tells the story of a single night and a police raid that takes place on a house where a group of suspected communists are meeting, but in fact, that's not really what's happening. And I thought maybe to situate our audience, you could just read a little bit from the very beginning of Dawn, which is divided into three sections. The first section is called The Raid. So this is from the beginning of The Raid. Thanks. <clears throat> the sun presses down on the city of Adana. It knows no other way. Autumn is here and evening has fallen, but still this suffocating humidity, this relentless heat, the Tukurova plains cannot bear much more. Let there be rain and soon. There is the blistering sun and the rainy season. The rich in their grand villas and gardens of paradise share generously of the seasons with the city's poor. But what comes from this fertile earth belongs to the rich alone. No sign of nature's abundance in the outlying shanty towns. No orange trees or palms. No bright southern flowers or fleshy broadleaf ornamental plants. Just these hot and humid fumes that pass for air, choking up the mean and narrow streets of the Independence District, seeping under every door. Soon the rain will come. The only plenty to be found is in the crowded rooms where night has already fallen, where the trays sit on the floor, and forks pile bright red radishes, green peppers, parsley, and spring onions over thick sliced bread, where the bed mats fly side by side. While outside, the watchman blows his whistle and fighting men spill out of the coffee houses to settle their scores in the street. 
Never a night in this district without a fight and a watchman's whistle. No one is surprised if a woman of low virtue has her face cut up by a razor. An evening begun with a few friendly drinks can drive a man of passion to violent excess. The district's liveliest night spot is its police station. There are also the roundups of hashish and cigarette smugglers. These two are routine. No one is surprised to see a police car crawling down a street blue light blinking, pausing before each house. The Arab workmen making their homes in these parts have long since wearied of such attentions. They close their doors. The police car, car crawls on, creeps down the road, one house at a time, each one identical to the last. A tricky business, locating an address in a neighborhood like this. To do so without attracting undue attention, the byword is stealth. It took just one rough kick to break down the flimsy door. One rough kick, and at last Oya understood. Since the moment of her arrival, tensions had been building, and now it was as if Hussein had vanished, taking Mustafa with him, and their host Ali of Marash, and all these others. Even Gusha, who only moments earlier had carried in their supper in a tray, she was gone too. It was just Oya in the room now. Oya, the on only unexpected guest, perched amongst the calico cushions at the end of the makeshift sofa. She'd never managed to draw these people out. One rough kick and they'd vanished inside themselves, locked themselves away. She was alone now, alone with the smashed door and the police flooding through it. The house and everyone in it, they were unraveling. They were spiraling out of reach, abandoning her to a self she'd too long taken for granted, a center that could no longer hold. She'd seen a lot of the real world, in recent years, but its ugly face still shocked her. This is not to say she thought reality could be given a face and so be judged as beautiful or ugly. It was just that she was more attuned to beauty, having been raised to appreciate beauty to a degree that some might find odd. Though she knew full well that there was beauty and ugliness in all things under the sun, she was still in the habit of closing one eye so as to separate out the beauty from the rest. In the name of beauty, she was willing to take any risk. She took courageous stands for no other reason than she found beauty and courage itself. Ask her to confront an ugly fact or indeed, and she collapsed. Oya was shocked by her own cowardice. This at least was how she would come to understand her panic when that door was so suddenly kicked in, even after all she'd been through. But this was not the time for idle soul searching. All over the city, police were kicking in doors. This was just one raid of many. Like it or not, Oya was going to have to accept that she was one of an angry, shocked, and terrified multitude. Think of all the others in this house alone. So many people, and she didn't know a single one. Ali of Marash, Hussein, and Mustafa, Ekrem, Zekeria, Husha, and Zinat. They were strangers, or they had been, until the police kicked the door in. Now, they were intimates facing a single fate. Thank you. There are so many reasons that I find that introduction extremely compelling, but one is that it sets up a kind of tension that I think marks the rest of the novel, which is this tension for the revolutionary or the aspiring revolutionary or the inadvertent revolutionary of feeling at once extremely alone and extremely abandoned to his or herself, and also feeling like they must be part of some larger collectivity, part of the multitude. And I wonder if you could just speak a little bit to that tension, which to me is the central tension among these characters in the novel. Well, yes, and uh, I think you know, having grown up um, around um, these uh, revolutionaries and having continued to work um, with so many after they were um, released from prison. Uh, I I never heard any of them. Uh, I, I I saw them live it, but I never heard it. Um, saw it. Um, uh, ex you know, uh, described and um, uh, understood. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think part of the isolation is um, that um, uh, they have all been stamped down so you know so often. But there is also um, the ideology 
you know, did any, uh, uh, you know, resistance and um, uh, so much so that you weren't, weren't supposed to have any emotions. Uh, it was against, so, so I went to, um, uh, um, you know, another um, uh, really interesting Zoom um, launch in Istanbul, I was here, mm -hmm. and a group of um, uh, really interesting feminist sociologists had been writing about um, uh, waiting, you know, how, uh, how, what, what it meant to be uh, waiting to get out of prison, what it meant to be um, uh, a refugee waiting to go home or waiting to get access. And they had uh, quite a number of uh, uh, famous um, people from the 70s there who were, who were there to give solidarity. And they got so upset. They just mm -hmm. said, you're not, the, the, the emotion is not, uh, not for now. It's, uh, it's, it gets in the way of the revolution. So I think a lot of it is this ideology um, and add to that, um, it's, it's not that, that different from, you know, patriarchal ideology, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't say anything, you have to be strong, you have to pretend, and um, there's nothing lonelier than that. Mm. Um, his, her male characters are, are amazing in this, in this book, because, um, well, not all of them, <laughs> but uh, the, um, they're so locked inside themselves, and they're so uh, longing uh, uh, to get out of themselves, even the the bad guys, you know, the police chief mm. and, and the head of Mediterranean manufacturing and so on. Yeah. Well, and there's, I mean, what you said about waiting is very interesting, and I'll come back to it in a moment, but the way that people are locked inside themselves in this novel seems to me at least to be very much mirrored by the way this third-person omniscient narrator we have introduces us to one character and then in a very brusque manner moves into the mind of another character or narrates what's going on in that character's thoughts through a kind of free and direct discourse and then abandons that character and moves on to the next one. And in this first section, at least, they are all quite isolated from one another by that narrator, aren't they? Yes, and they're all stuck in the same tiny room. Yes. Uh, that's, uh, so um, there is that claustrophobia and also the way that that first part is structured is always going coming back to the time that the door is getting broken down. So so it's um, you know, its treatment of time is really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. it's, its tenses are uh, quite a challenge to translate because the jumping can you say back. A bit of, can you say because even so I have the um, I have the advanced reading copy, which one is not supposed to quote from. And even as you were reading. I was noting some tense changes in the version you were reading and the version I have, but of course there are wonderful yeah. moments where you jump from the sort of pluperfect yeah. to present, from the past to the present. So how did you handle that? Uh, well, I, I, because she's a very, very precise writer, um, I was trying to, as much as possible, to stay with what she was, uh, had chosen to do um, because I felt that, it, well, I knew that she was doing it on purpose. But, you know, as you know, uh, um, uh, Turkish generally moves back and forth between present and past um, more um, easily than, than we do. So there are, the, there are the times when one, you know, um, one or one's editor decides it's just too, it's too, um, it, it's too disjointed. And um, uh, so it was like a, a sentence by sentence, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, the the first um, very very long section. Uh, I think is meant to be um, disorienting, um, and it's it's meant to be um, this. Yeah, this you do get uh, accounts of uh, conversations that go on. But the most important thing about Oya is that she's been kind of invited there at the last moment uh, on a kind of a dare. You know, this is a, 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 a socialist. A, a socialist lawyer's um, brother that he's very competitive with has just come out of prison, and so he decides to show up and 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 bring this um, well-known um, uh, political prisoner with them. And but when she gets there, the women don't know. Nobody knows what to do with a woman who's a free woman, you know, because she's not a relative. So the women don't know how to talk to her. The men don't know how to talk to her. So she's just stuck there. And right. She's the only one at the table. So. Um, you, it's not just the the, uh, the the loneliness of the revolutionaries, although there's plenty of that. It's this 
um, this horrible clash of um, class and gender going on because it's a very very modest uh, household. You know, they're they're workers and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, they all want yeah they're and even the the the, uh, the family the working class family that uh, that lives there is not unified at all um, because um, the the um, uh, the niece is. Um, Who's living with them is uh, has married somebody who who was brought up was an orphan and brought up by the gray wolves and the gray wolves are the the great fascists of Turkey and so you have yeah you have all these things going on at the same time compressed compressed and then yeah and it's interesting because you know you read that part a, a tricky business locating an address in a neighborhood like this to do so without attracting undue attention the byword is stealth and then there's a break. And we get Oya's perspective on that door being kicked in, and we get all these names, Hussein, Mustafa, Ali, Marash, Gusha, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And for a moment, as a reader, you kind of inhabit the position of the police kicking down the door and yeah. finding these people there and you know, having to figure out which ones are going to be taken in, what each person's history is, what each person's intentions are. And so there's a strange way in which reading this, you're kind of participating in the surveillance or doing a better job of surveillance than the police who completely, as we learn, bungle the surveillance yeah. we're supposed to do. Yeah. And that's yeah. how you felt like that translating it, that the reader occupies this very odd position on the threshold between the police and the guests. Well, I, I think it's the, the translator before the reader, uh, yes. or the, yes. the, the, the first translator. It's um, the, uh, what I'm, always interested in, um, in in her as a writer is uh, how she um, uh, through these um, these weird shifts of perspective uh, and you know turning perspective inside out and uh, that she creates um, the atmosphere which is the um, which your mother will recognize it was the atmosphere of the time it's what we all felt um uh, uh uh oddly um which would never be uh, it it would it would be impossible to portray through a single perspective mm -hmm. or or through a stable perspective or even a series of stable perspectives this is um it's the um the paranoia uh and uh isolation of well let's just call it um, well, a police state, uh, authoritarian yeah. state, and it, um, uh, and in a certain sense, it never quite goes away. I mean, one of the the so-called failed coup of 2016. I mean, it was such, it was so odd living through um, that, you know, at a remove because all of us who uh, lived uh, through the coups, 1960, 1971, 1980, um, uh, you know, people were. were they were crying. The, tr the trauma returned to them, yeah, and yes. uh, and and also it was the the the, the uh, iconography of of that that final failed coup um, didn't quite fit. It wasn't quite how it wasn't happening the way it should. It really really upset people. I don't know um, how how your mother. Uh, how your parents felt about it but uh, no no i think they felt the it was there was a kind of confusion of where to place it yeah 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 so I, yeah, i'm sorry go ahead no, i just think that uh, it's um so it's this um particular artistic effect of which she's trying to recreate create is the the, the the shared psychology of the time and right. i felt like uh well for me she did it yeah no, she, I think she does it wonderfully. And, and one of the ways that she does it, you, you already mentioned waiting, but, and, and how in this first long section, each section within it, each subsection uh, goes back to that moment when the door is kicked down before going into the mind of one character and kind of tunneling into their past, tunneling, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. tunneling resurrecting the trauma that that door being kicked down is bringing back to the surface. Yeah. And I was actually surprised when I was reading it to find her move away so quickly from Oya to the men, which you mentioned, these brothers, Mustafa and Hussein, uh, brothers who are themselves struggling, Mustafa in particular, with what it means to be a good revolutionary. And yeah. 
way that his own behavior, the way that his lack of bravery, the way that his misogyny, the way that his selfishness is always giving the lie to his sense of his political obligation. So could you talk a little bit about her, her men? Her men, uh, well, she really understands them. Um, and uh, I don't think they ever, ever confessed anything to her because it's too internal. I mean, that, that, the character of Mustafa, he's the, 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 um, you know, the, the most um, de dedicated revolutionary and he's, um, you know, he's never done anything, but he's just picked up and um, uh, sent to a prison and kept there for a year without um, uh, without charge. But he was very, you know, active in Istanbul student uh, uh, student circles uh, before before he started working. But the thing um, I love about that character is that he has a you know he examines his conscience uh, mm -hmm. in a in a way that I find. Um, well, I, I know to be rare. <laughs> um, certainly doesn't share it with his brother. Yeah, and uh, and 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 he's been thinking also you know, about. Uh, you know, he he talks a lot about his time in prison and the, the solidarity. He 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 wasn't. He did have company in prison. They 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 were they were close to one another. Yeah, um, but um, but what they couldn't really talk, there were things that he remembers that they can't really talk about. And that's what torture has done to them. Um, right, right. Yeah. it's given them even, even further inward. And, and you know, can we also just talk a little bit about the other women that are not present at the table, uh, who are in the kitchen, they're making the kufte. And yeah. when that door breaks down, they, they associate it as, or they treat it as a judgment on their cooking. Yeah, the, the special kind of funny there. moments. There are these, there are these kind of hor hor horrifically funny moments yeah. where that door breaks down, and you know, Gushan, the the women who have been cooking believe that it's a kind of referendum on yeah. meat. Yeah. And compared and to yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and compared, uh, yeah, and compared to them, Oya at one moment thinks that she's neither male nor female. She's yeah. been desexed or degendered in That's that. Bad. Yes, yes, yes. So can you talk a little bit about that, about those those distinctions between women that we find in that first? Uh, well, it is, uh, as I said before, it's uh, it's it's more about class than, uh, than, than it is uh, even about gender, um, because um, gender roles change so much in the um, um, still at that time quite small middle class. Uh, mm -hmm. And so in the urban small middle class, the urban, um, uh, you know, more tenured women professors, more doctors, more lawyers um, than, than in um, any country in the West, uh, really in the early 70s. But, uh, but then you have the other, the other country um, where, uh, especially in the East, where um, nothing has changed. And, and that includes the, uh, the bourgeoisie, yeah, uh, which, we, which we also have in this. So, um, so they're uh, also, they're à vie. They're all the so that's uh, they're they're Muslim, but they're they're um, anti-establishment Muslims who don't pray to Mecca and, and so on. So there's all all that going on, um, and they um, they're very um, you know the woman is the women are there to serve the women are there to serve um, the you know Zinat who's the niece um, really she has big aspirations you know but it's about her you know what kind of quilt she's going to get from from her first marital house so it's very very homebound um the the most interesting portrayal of a woman in the book uh is um Guler, who's the actually doesn't appear in the book but she's Mustafa's uh pretty estranged wife who's been gone taken from Istanbul to 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 Urfa which is a very very remote city and um and when she and they 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 had a, a kind of a marriage of equals but when she gets to Urfa, he starts treating her um, the, the way anybody else in Urfa would treat his wife, and and the relatives are all, all always turning up, and there are lots of them because the relatives all have to help each other or 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 disappear. Yeah, but she's supposed to serve them and so on. Um, again, it's 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 Mustafa who, um, when examining his conscience, um, explains that. Um, uh, quite completely. He's he's very haunted by it. He and is, 
and and you know we we spend that first section i think uh, getting to know that cast of characters who we spy at the table in that first moment when the door gets kicked down and then in the second section the second section is called the interrogation and uh, five of them are taken to the police station to be interrogated so we have another kind of claustrophobic small space in which we see mostly Oya, Ali, Mustafa being interrogated. And there's a wonderful, there's, there's uh, one of the things I think that Soisal does so incredibly well is uh, represent how interrogation, even of innocent people, sows the seeds of self-doubt. And yes. Those the seeds of the desire to confess to crimes one did not commit. And I can't quite put my finger on how she does that, but I'm hoping that, that you can, because that was ex just an extraordinarily tense feeling that I had as I was reading that long second section. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I, again, it's um, how she uses, um, how she creates that classified atmosphere. And also, as you're reading that, um, this, and it, certainly as you're translating it, you know, it's the night that never ends. It's the night that never ends, and um, and so um, uh, for for me, the um, what uh, you know, what stayed, what has stayed with me most is she thinks that she's getting her period. Yeah. Yes. She yes. She's she's worried. Worried. And, and yes. so, and she's cursing herself first of all for um, not. Um, not having brought the, you know what she needs to bring and, and not wanting to ask or realizing all the stores are closed and then um and i think her her period does start and, and so this is um her um her uh it it becomes a very very you know she feels shame because she's a woman first and foremost and and and, and that gets it gets more and more magnified mm -hmm. yeah um and then of course um the other thing that stays with me is that you know she's taken um she's has a um she doesn't know how to quite how to she's not been interrogated in that way before really and so she does she um she doesn't in her view handle it very well um but, but she's being insulted all the time and so on uh Musafa later on um knows how to you know this is nothing compared to what he's been through but then she's taken to um another room and told um to write her confession and that's when she sees the electric tension mm. and then that sends her into um a very very long uh series of memories yeah Which and instead of writing and, and instead of instead of writing or the time that we are led to believe that she spends writing what is nothing a non-confession basically on yeah. that she writes one word tension <laughs> one word, truncheon, right. She the time that she spends writing that one word, truncheon, she's actually thinking back to the women's prison that yeah. she was in and to the women who kept her company. And, and they are given to us as both kind of beautiful and yeah. pathetic, but also ugly. I'm thinking about that section you read at the beginning about the way one looks upon the beautiful and the ugly. Yeah. And she's in there, yeah. but you know. A totally remorseless killers, uh, yeah, yeah. drug smugglers, et cetera, et cetera. And they are both beautiful in their kind of sisterhood and also ugly in what they have done without apparently thinking twice about it. Yeah, yeah. And then there's also the, so there's two prisons. There's the civil prison and then the, um, and then the first political prison. Um, and um, again, I, it's, it's the truncheon that keeps coming back in, in the, it, it's the people, there's a lot of, um, uh, uh, so many women were raped with electric tensions, uh, uh starting uh, in in that coup and then la later coups, and um, and then when she gets to the and, and some of them are really destroyed by it uh, at the political prison. When she gets to the the civil prison with uh, with uh, um, which is wild, which is um, uh, when when she describes arriving in that prison, again I felt like I was there and not knowing where to sit <laughs> right, yeah right, right, uh, right. Um, but they're laughing about the electric truncheons all the time yeah um they're making it a big joke and they um uh and um violence which is 
um, certainly a theme that runs through all of this and uh, is uh, violence is so much part of their lives. And of course they have committed murders themselves. Yeah. Um, and, and violence and obscenity, uh, violence and obscenity, these are things that those women kind of reclaim or they make their their own, right? Yeah, they yeah, they yeah, yeah, against yeah. the men who have used it against them. I mean, what are we supposed to make of that? Because that's a very uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah I don't know if we're, um, I, I think, um, I don't, I think that we're just supposed to see it uh, with, uh, not with one eye closed. Yeah. Right. And, right. Uh, and also wonder about it and, um, and remember that it's there. And um, I think that that's the, uh, the journey that she's uh, taking in, uh, in writing this book, mm -hmm. which has some, uh, you know, has some autobiographical um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, inspiration because she was a, um, you know, did do, uh, Sevgi herself did do um, uh, internal exile in Adana. And, yeah. and so that's happened, yeah. I mean, um, I, I think I think what what jumps out to me about it, at least, is that she's a very kind of non-judgmental, non-moralizing writer, and of course, that's what one fears when you read a certain kind of political literature that it will curdle into dogma or yeah. into moralism. And everything that we've been talking about so far, her shifts of perspective, the way that she's kind of playing with memory, with trauma, with time the way she shows the beautiful and the ugly in these in these solidarity movements. I, all of this is, I think, in the service of a kind of non-judgmentalness often. Yeah. I, and that even extends to some of the characters that we want to judge more harshly, like her policemen. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like yeah. Abdullah, who's the policeman who kind of orchestrates the raid and his boss. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what it means for anyone, uh, but particularly for a kind of Turkish leftist feminist to extend that sort of sympathetic novelistic imagination to the men who were raping women, the men who were beating them. I, I, mean, I think she shows that they're, um, they're as much prisoners um, uh, of, um, of the political culture and the economic culture, um, the culture uh, as, uh, as any of, of the others, and th that this is why they're violent, um, mm -hmm. and um, and so I think if if she hadn't, I mean, I think she has, she does have a moral vision. She's not moralistic, uh, but it is, um, or it's a uh, a tragic vision of mm -hmm. a of a country that is locked inside uh, this cycle of um, uh, torture, you know, violence. Uh, which breeds more violence. Um, the you know, I have, I, I do feel that it's it is like Orhan Pamuk's snow, but just um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, compressed uh, again. It's uh, you know, my heart aches for everybody um, in that book, um, and in, in even the the really bad guys because they are um, uh, they are lost, they are down, they are alone, mm -hmm. and. Um, and the only time they feel at all good is when they kick somebody mm. or, or, yeah. Um, Are there uh, any characters your heart doesn't ache for? Because I can think of one that, uh, uh, that I have yeah. very little sympathy for, but, but I'm wondering if there are any characters where you feel like the moral vision is a little bit more absolutist than what we've been discussing so far. Some people that the the people that are just unforgivable, absolutely unforgivable. Yes, or, yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, I mean, I don't like the retired colonel who's head of the um, uh, um, so the 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 industrialist, mm -hmm. uh, but he's he's a miserable piece of shit uh, so, <laughs> and uh uh who else i yeah hmm. who, who I was thinking, it? well i was thinking about the character of uh zekeria oh god yeah the, the, zekeria, the, zekeria yeah who who you know is yeah. uh no slobbering all over the policeman's policeman yeah. and uh, immediately goes to sign up with the fascists after he's released, even though he hasn't been tortured at all uh, or interrogated. Really, there's a kind of lack of courage in the 
that sort of slavish devotion to authority such that he can't even imagine another way of being. So that for me is yeah. the, yeah, the yeah, kind you're of- right. You're right, you're um, right. Um, and then on the other hand, because uh, not only are we uh, in that section section, in that second section in a police station, a lot of it, uh, the most important parts um, are in the, in the cell where they're waiting, yeah? Yes. Yes. And uh, another ex extraordinary part of the book for me is um, uh, are the, uh, the 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 old man and the young man um, uh, who are Kurds. Now, um, at the time that this book was written, um, people you know people like you know that writing alongside Sidney just they weren't really interested in the Kurds. They just really uh, they just didn't know about it. Uh, it's it's afterwards that. Uh, uh, things started changing. Um, there was lack of interest. There was contempt, and she really, really, uh, just with the, those two, um, uh, that pair, uh, who are really going to get it. You can, uh, and she really writes out. Um, it's it's the, the Kurdish tragedy writ small, um, or as it comes in. So, um, and then of course Zakaria, um, he goes to the fascists. Well. Um, He's not the only one. Right. Uh, so, uh, but he, she's she's pointing out that it's a lack of, uh, you know, a lack of courage. I mean, we all know that that party that uh, that um, he goes to belong to was founded by uh, somebody who was an Armenian orphan. Right. You know that, okay? And then uh, he, he admitted it at the end of his life. So it's um, when people are just so insecure about um, uh, who they are. Um, mm -hmm that's that's where they go that's where they go I think something that you just said the Kurdish tragedy writ small makes me think differently about the novel which is you know it, I mean it is the Turkish tragedy or the nation the the national tragedy writ small put in these claustrophobic airless frozen rooms and it yeah. makes you realize that a whole nation can feel like a jail cell or a whole yeah. nation can feel like that kitchen table at the moment when the police yeah. kick yeah. down the door. Yeah. And the way she's playing yeah. there between the small or the tragic writ small and the tragic writ large is extremely interesting. Is she doing that in her other novels as well? Uh, not not as much as uh, yes, but but this is my you know this is this is the one for me. Um, um, it's it's the one that. Um, uh, explains to me the atmosphere that um, I don't know how I absorbed, um, which is uh, no, you know, being very, very afraid of saying, you know, knowing somehow that if you talked about certain things, um, it could be all over. Yeah. So this, this, this uh, pervasive fear at a time when, you know, in a society when everything seems very cheerful. Um, if you walk down the street, there's lots of activity, but underneath it is this huge fear. And I've never been able to uh, explain to um, people who haven't lived, uh, grown up in Turkey um, what what that feels like. And I think that's what only a brilliant novelist can um, can begin to do. That and um, yeah. So we are nearing the end of our hour. We have about ten minutes left for questions. Uh, so if you have questions, please throw them into the chat. I will ask them. We have our first one from Spencer. And Spencer says, I would love to know more about Soysal's readership during her lifetime. Was she widely read during her lifetime in Turkey? Is she still read? Uh, she was um, uh, she was widely read. Uh, at that, she was she was very prominent. I mean, she had a really prominent role in uh, 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 Turkish radio and television. Um, she wrote lots of columns. Uh, she uh, so uh, you know that Yildirim Bölge, the the account of prison, um, was one of the you know, flagship uh, accounts of political prison when uh, when when the military regime ended and so on. So she she really had a had a presence. Um, and and she was read and she was prosecuted as I was saying so um, so she was uh, you know a, a, somebody who was getting a lot of notice uh, inside and outside her novels and uh, and yes uh, it she became the you know what for me the most important um, member of the twelfth of March 
generation, which is what they call the writers that come out of that time, out of that coup, 1971 coup. Um, and uh, it's it's um, uh, largely because of her daughter, who was maybe one year old when she died, um, uh, who's worked really hard to bring her, um, get everything back into print, that she's uh, enjoyed um, a revival. Also, I have to say, I mean, there's like um, the feminist academics in Turkey um, or Turkish feminist academics uh, outside Turkey who work together with them. Uh, they have been absolutely amazing in um, going back um, to the uh, forgotten women writers of the 20th century and uh, writing um, uh, critically about them and getting their books published. And, uh, and Funda is part of, uh, Funda Soysa is part of that. And she does speak to um, women now really, really powerfully, um, mm -hmm. um, particularly to women. Uh, yeah. So we have another question from an anonymous, uh, someone who's anonymous. Uh, Marve mentioned the differences in verb tenses between Turkish and English. What were some of the other challenges of translating Dawn? I, I have a sense from reading the English, but I wanna hear what, what you have to say, Maureen. Uh, well, it was, uh, it's, um, she's very, um, she does amazing things with words, um, suggesting things, um, and also um, using the passive voice, which is very, very um, much loved in Turkey and very beautiful in Turkish, yeah? Uh, and that makes it very hard to put it into English because um, um, you, we need to know who, why, what, where, when. But of course, in that kind of atmosphere of that pervasive atmosphere of, uh, of um, dread and, and, and fear. Uh, the passive voice is really uh, one more um, uh, technique to, um, uh, to um, enhance that feeling, yeah, or to strengthen that feeling. Um, uh, I worried, of course, because the, the context is so Turkish. Uh, I don't like to, I, I don't add anything. Um, I didn't want to add any explanations about uh, about the politics, and I was just hoping that they would be um, clear enough or easy enough to pass over without getting stuck on them. Uh, what was yours? What well, was I, I had I had two. I I wondered um, how much some of the humor, oh, how, yeah, particularly among the women in the prison, would translate, and maybe related to that. I mean, there are just so many interesting idioms in Turkish that. Yeah. When you try to translate into English, lose something of their flavor. It's very hard to figure out how to reword it into English, such that it retains its punchiness and its. And that its, was correct. Yeah, so that, I was, but I, I thought you did a brilliant job with that. And you can, you know, if you're reading it as someone who can guess what the Turkish might be, then you can also guess the other ways it could have been translated and would have been uh, translated not as well as you did. So I think the the because the women in the in the civil prison um uh, uh they're you know they they had very um unusual ways of speaking very um um uh, very um yeah, rough, yeah. Very yeah, rough. Right. and then they would um they would compose these little um poems um which were um uh, very vague but deliberately vague and um uh, I've, uh, I guess the, I, I try not to get locked into uh, imitating um, dialects. I just I find, yeah. Um, and, and so I, um, I know that one loses something, but really, because um, Turkish uh, has, for the, uh, translating Turkish into English has so many different types of obstacles. So problems about yeah, word order and it's an agglutinate language. So you have lots of suffixes and, and the vowel harmony means that the vowels are changing. So you don't often know, sometimes just don't know where a word, um, uh, you know, where the root noun is, you know. You have, have. Um, and so what matters to me the most um, uh, is, is the music of Turkish, the music of it. And and because um, I hear it really, really strongly because I listen to it, nobody would teach it to me. And so I was just listening to it for years and years before um, I could piece things together and, and learning other languages, but um, yeah. So the music is really, really strong. And it's my great love, the music of Turkish. And so 
where there are these lexical problems. Um, it, uh, it's it's that that takes me through, and also making sure that the that, that the sentences flow forward in the way they do in Turkish instead of doubling back on themselves, which they can do um, if if you spend too much time on thinking about the sense right. and, and only the sense. Yeah, that's very helpful. That's very helpful. Actually, you're also making me realize the way that my the habits or the protocols of my first language affect my writing in English. As you were speaking, I was just thinking about how I have zero consistency among my tenses when I write a paragraph. It's in half, you know, present tense, half past tense, and I can never figure out why. Or <laughs> so I was diagnosing my own issues. Oh, we have a, another question from an anonymous attendee who says, "Is there anything in particular you would ask readers to pay special attention to in reading the book? What do you hope American readers take away from it?" Uh, I would like you to. Um just go with the flow. Um, and um, although it's, you know, it takes place in the early 1970s in a remote, um, I won't say remote because you were born there. Okay, so Southeastern city, yeah. um, uh, far from, uh, you know, far from uh, the capital, far from, from Istanbul. Um, it's um, anatomy of a, of a society is not that different from our own. You know, we are, um, you know, we are we are different and we are the same. Um, the, the, this tragedy of um, you know violence uh, and and isolation and so on is is ours. Uh, I'm, I hope you can tell I'm American, so it's 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 ours in America too. And sometimes when you read something that takes place uh, so far away, um, you can see things in your own uh, in, in in your own place more clearly so it's a it's um it's a companion it's a companion to our tragedy I suppose yeah maybe I would just add to that if you don't if you don't mind Maureen I would I would say that I mean I've already alluded to this a couple of times but you know one of the extraordinary things about Soisal I think is that she gives you a novel that is on the one hand extremely interested in the political, the structural conditions that uh, make people or, or encourage people to behave in particular ways. Mm -hmm. And those particular ways are representative of a class, a gender, a nationality, the way that all of those different categories of identity intersect. But at the same time, she gives you, I think, entirely singular and deep characters yeah and I think those two things go together they don't cancel one another out in her in her writing I think it's uh what she's most deeply interested in is is how we live how we live uh and um uh, how we get through these tragedies I mean they, they there are a few of the characters do come out of this with with very important things very hard won things and um uh, and she's not interested. She's interested in in these are real people. I mean, they're not real people, but they're just, but they're just people that um, that she's come to understand really, really deeply. And um, but how do any of us uh, live inside these structures? How do we ever reach out to the others with um, honesty and compassion? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Yeah. And I won't spoil the ending, but for people who do want to know what to pay attention to, I think you pay attention to the ending. Yes. I think, yes. It, gives you, I think it gives you a very beautiful vision of precisely what Maureen is, is describing. Yeah, thank you. Noah, over to you. Thank you both so much. This was really fantastic. Just a wonderful conversation. I could listen all night, but um, Maureen, I know you're, it's very late where you are, so we should let you get to bed. Um, those of you at home, thank you so much for being here, for your thoughtful questions. Please consider purchasing a copy of Dawn. Uh, it's beautiful inside and out. It's got this amazing cover by Edo Adnan. Um, buy it from Community Bookstore, or Third Place Books, Brookline Booksmith, or your favorite independent bookstore. And we hope to see you at another virtual event really soon. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great evening. Yaksham Bye-bye.